This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today, we're all cooperatively trying to save the planet together. We're going to be using different special abilities of different characters, trying to seal the gate to save the planet, and do so by trying to figure out a puzzling mechanism similar to the old-fashioned game Mastermind. Today we're taking a look at this cooperative game from now Gray Fox Games that you can get this game from called Rising 5. So I'm going to show you how the game works, and I'll see you on the other side. Here's the gorgeous Rising 5 board illustrated by Vincent Dutre. Now in this game it's cooperative. You're essentially trying to find out which of the four runes are supposed to be here and in which order or location they're supposed to be. There's a total of seven of them. So throughout the game, you will be trying to mix and match, move them around, get clues as to which ones are right, which ones are wrong. And you're trying to get these four in the right way at the end of the game to win, but you're not really sure which ones they are at the beginning of the game. However, you do start with any four random ones there at the beginning. Now you'll lose the game if this uh, a counter comes all the way down to the red moon or if this deck gets completely uh, you know, emptied out at the end. These are cards that you're going to be picking up on your hand and playing them throughout the game as cards. Now you'll actually scan that with the app and it will show you what's right and what's wrong. For example, this is what the app's showing us and the game comes with a bunch of these tokens. Now what this means is that each color rune in the game is secretly attached to a certain animal, and that will change each game. So in this case, we have a snake here, and there's these different tokens. So this snake tells us that, A, it's, first of all, it's part of the solution. If you see it looking like this, where it's outlined with a bunch of little crystals in it. Uh, same with the spider. So we know that two of the colors that we started the game with are part of the solution, but they're in the wrong location. So a different spot of those four ways you can put the parts. Uh, and then these two we know are not in there. So if it's black with a red outline, it means they're wrong. And we need to figure out which ones of those twos are. So two of them are right, but they're in the wrong location. Two of them we need to get out of there. And over the course of the game, you're going to deduce which those are. And so this app helps you through that. So how do we figure out what these are? Well, in order to basically check and see if you're right or what's changed, you're going to have to take these four cubes and place them on here. And then as an action on your turn, you can try to seal the gate and check to see how many things have changed, which are right, which are wrong. But then these will come off. So throughout the game, you're going to be trying to take actions to get four of these green cubes here. So you can check your work. It will come back off. And that's sort of the flow of the game, what the main point of the game is to do. But there's other things you'll be doing. There's three different numbered locations. Each of those locations have two cards out. So let's talk about how our turn works. On your turn, you're simply going to activate your cards. These cards would be in your hand where nobody else could see them. And you're going to select one of these characters for your turn. And you can do up to one action per card you have of that. So if I wanted to move Echo, which is this guy's name, or if I wanted to use them, I would basically be, this is the only card I could play, which means I would only get one action with Echo. However, with um, Nova, I actually have two cards, so I could do up to two actions with her if I decided, and same with Ellie. I could use two of these and do that. So let's do that. I'm going to say these would be in my hand. I'm going to play these two to a discard pile, and you have to decide beforehand how many actions you're taking before you see the results of your actions. So I'm going to discard these two and say I'm going to take two actions with Ellie. So there's really three types of things you can do uh, on your turn. One of them is to move. So you're going to move from this very beginning spot the first time you use a character to one of the locations. But you'll notice each of these have a special ability that must be activated before you take any actions. This one is, hey, when you use her, you can move this counter up. Remember, if it gets all the way down, you lose. So great, we'll use that ability and we'll push that up. Now, one of the two actions I can use is to move her and you can move from one location to any other location. Now that I'm there, I have a second action because I used two cards. I'm going to encounter this card. Now, there's three types of things that can happen with an encounter. This is one of them. This is just you're going to get a clue. This is a very powerful card. By the way, each of these levels get harder and harder, but the starting cards are the same each game. So this will allow us to get a clue. So in the app, we can actually touch the clue button and it can say, OK, which color do you want a clue about? Let's go ahead and hit purple. It says, do you want a clue? We say yes. And it's going to tell us, ooh, purple is the spider. So we know that purple has to be in here because the spider was actually part of the clue. We got that from the beginning. So now that we know for sure that purple is the spider, we will place it right here. And this will help us track and keep track of our logic throughout the game. We know that purple is the spider and that it's just in the wrong location. 
Now, since we've used both of her turns, uh, her actions are over. These would go to a discard pile. At the end of her turn, one of these would come out. That happens to be a monster. We'll talk about those later. Now, you have a hand limit, but before you draw cards, you have to draw at least one. You can say as many as you want up to your hand limit, but you have to say it before you start drawing these. So let's say, yes, they wanted to draw up to two. They would draw them and put these in their hand. However, over the course of the game, you're going to come up to these red moon cards. These are evenly placed throughout the deck. There's a certain amount of them depending on the difficulty of the game. Three for a beginner game, four for standard, and five for heroic. And when you see this, that player would have to stop drawing cards no matter how many they drew. And that tells you that there's going to be one more round before this bad red moon thing is going to happen. And at the end of that next round, for every red moon you see on all of the cards and monsters that are out on the board, in this case, we have one, two, three, four, but some monsters can have more than one, but we have a total of four. If the next player did not take out any of those monsters, when they get to the end of their turn, this is gonna go down that many to four. Remember, if you get here, you lose. So this gives you a little bit of inkling of what's coming up. So let's show you just how a, uh, another turn might work. Somebody might move their, the, this character there, and then they had a second action that they were able to do, and this is a monster they're gonna try to attack. Now this tells you the strength of the monster and tells us the reward. If we win, we'll be able to put this here. Remember, we need four of these to be able to try to see if we're correct. Now, we're gonna roll this die. Now this die, we need at least a two, but if it rolls the red moon, the other eclipse, we automatically lose that battle. However, if there's at least one other character there, you get a plus one. Plus, if anybody else has cards in their hand that match the character that you just moved there, like this, they can decide to actually discard those cards to give you another plus one, and you can do as many of these as you like, but keep in mind that one out of six chances you could still possibly lose. So let's say one player discards one of these cards, we have a plus one, so basically we have a plus two, and this is a two. So essentially, in this case, unless we rolled this, we would, you know, we, we, would, we would beat it. And if we beat it, we get to place that cube right here, and this would get discarded. That's how you encounter a monster. Now, some cards you encounter just give you an A, which is an artifact. And these cards allow you to do different things, like re-rolling the combat die, or getting another clue like we saw earlier, or getting two of those green cubes to get, try to check our answer, or to move that, the, the sun marker up two. So how do you go about changing these out? Well, when you activate the oracle, that, that character's special ability is to swap out one of those things. So you can either take one of these and remove it and replace it with one that's not there, or you could take any two and swap their location. Now we know that purple is in the clue somewhere, we just know it's in the wrong spot. So we could, if we want to, swap purple with, let's say, orange. So we would do it just like that, and let's say over the course of the game, we continue to take actions that allowed us to get these four, and then you could take the action to try to seal the gate, you would scan this, and the app would tell us what we're, you know, how well have we done, and then this would clear off. Now after scanning, we get this, which gives us a lot of great information. We did the right thing in this case, because we know that the purple was the spider and it's not in the location, and it still isn't in the right location. So we know that purple can't be here or here. However, the snake is now in the right location before it was not. So we know we can deduce that orange must be the snake and it's in the right spot. So we, we've got the orange, we want to keep it there. So this is again when we use the tokens to put on the board, we know that orange is the snake, we don't want to move it, and we know that we can now remove the other two colors that are not orange and purple from the board, which means two of these three other colors are going to be in the solution. Now that's generally how the game works, players are going to keep taking turns until either you've won by getting this correct, or you lose by having this complete deck gone, or this getting all the way down to here. So let's talk about a couple more things before I let you go. Now, each of the three levels has a boss monster. They're really hard to beat, uh, but if you beat them, usually you get a, a clue and you get one of these relics. Now, this one is this. This would be, you can play it when you want. You get three of those green cubes towards uh, sealing the gate. The, one of the other monsters allows you to basically attack any other monster that's out on the board, essentially killing a monster that has any strength of one, two, three, or four. And on the right, we have the Eclipse Pendants, which basically allows you to ignore one of these cards. So they're very powerful, but they're hard to beat as well. So let's talk about some of the other special abilities. Hal allows you to take the special ability of somebody else that's in the same location as them, essentially using one of those if they're in the same location, not counting the starting location, of course. Uh, Echo allows you to move a different character to any location. And Nova allows you to basically roll the die and combat any monster that's on the board. However, when you use this, if you lose, nothing happens. Because normally, if you go to this location and you end up losing the combat, this would end up going down the amount of um, uh, you know, red moons that's on the card. That's pretty much it. If you win, you win by getting this all correct up here. And if you lose, you'll do that by doing this or by losing all of the cards. Okay, first of all, 
great Vincent Dutre art. He's probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite artists in board games and the board and everything just looks gorgeous as you think it would if it's a Vincent Dutre game. Uh, and it is, he's, the, the art is just awesome. It looks so good, it kind of draws you in first good positive there. Uh, next is this game essentially is Mastermind with a game wrapped around it. Now as a kid I played a lot of Mastermind. If you ever played this old game it's just very simple. Some different colored pegs and someone's behind there looking at them and you're giving them different you're trying to figure out what it is and they're telling you whether things are right if they're in the right spot if they're in the right colors or vice versa and from that you're deducing which ones to keep trying and working through things to try to find the right code essentially it's that you're basically playing mastermind but with a real game sort of wrapped around it and i've always sort of liked lately in gaming people are bringing back games that have familiar mechanisms some like bingo some like you know a lot of these older mechanisms that people are bringing in and bringing them into and modernizing them and making them real games and i like that and this sort of does that uh, I like how it sort of mixes the standard co-op with that deduction aspect because, you know, co-op games I enjoy typically a lot, uh, and I really love deduction games. They're some of my favorites, but you don't often see those two together. It's sort of a unique recipe, so I I'm really happy that they brought those two mechanisms together. I like the different special abilities of the characters because all of them are very important, and in order to win, you're going to need to use those abilities well and at the right time and i like that you're, you're you're sort of doing that and using those special abilities to get you there i like that you're picking the cards before your actions and before drawing so you're deciding at the beginning of your turn which character you're going to activate by the way i like that each player can activate any of the characters no one's just this one character which is another big positive because you know sometimes in co-op games you get a character that you don't really like and here you can basically play any of the characters but you're deciding before you start to make actions how many of those cards you're using, how many actions you're, you're taking, and that's good because you can't just do things and react and do things and react. You've got that sort of press your luck mechanism built into that. Also, when you're trying to draw cards at the end, you need to decide how many you're drawing before you draw them, and it might come up the red moon and your turn will end. So I really like that mechanism of needing to talk about that, how many cards you're using before those. Uh, the app works really well in this game. It scans really well. Uh, and I love how it sort of shows you your historic scans. I don't know how you would play the game otherwise uh, if, if it had an app that didn't do this. Uh, I know that you can play the game without the app. What I'm talking about is the app does a good job of once you scan, it shows you all your, your past scans. So you can look at those and say, okay, well, here was this, and then we did this and this, and now we see this, so that must mean this. And I like that you can kind of go back through historical ones and study them because that's really the crux of trying to figure out the deduction of this game. I also like that the cards that you have are not open. People are holding them as hands, and at times you're gonna be asking players, hey, if I use this character, can anybody help me? Okay, if I use this one, can anyone help me? And you're kind of doing that, you're not looking at everything open, you're not looking at someone at your turn, you're gonna go, you know what, you're gonna give me this card, you're gonna give me this card, and I'm gonna go there. It can't really happen in this game because people are holding cards. It sort of reduces that. It doesn't completely take it away like some co-op games do, but it definitely does reduce it. I like that there's ways to mitigate the dice by asking players for cards and having different more people at the area. You, you know, you get a, an, extra di, uh, an extra plus one if you have at least one extra player there, plus players can add those cards that you're asking for that I was just talking about to sort of mitigate that dice roll. Uh, the solo game works well, um, in fact, uh, pretty well to the point where I, I enjoyed it. Uh, and this kind of gets me towards some of the cons of the game, which is, you know, when I played this game solo, I found myself saying, you know what? I'd rather just play Mastermind at that point, because really that's the part I liked the best about the game anyway. And if I'm going to do it solo, this is a way that you can play sort of Mastermind solo. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to play this solo. And after a while, I'm like, okay, well, let's just, let's just not even play the characters. Let me just try to get this thing right in a certain amount of turns or something like that. I started playing that. So uh, let's go to some of the negatives. First of all, it can come down to the luck of the roll. Now, I mentioned one of the positives is you can mitigate the dice, and that's true. But the other one, you know, the downside of that is, you know, you it can come down to, hey, you've got an extra player there, you've got an extra, you know, you've got people helping with cards, and you roll the eclipse at the wrong, the wrong point, and it's it, it sort of, you know, it, you can end the game on a bad dice roll. It can happen. So just be note that some people might not like that. I didn't mind it because, you know, that was just part of the game, and you can try to mitigate it. But in the end, you know, you should have done some other things better, I guess. Uh, also, I think it plays up to five players. I just think five players is just too many for this game. Uh, you're not getting as many turns. Again, you can kind of help with the cards, but it's just not as interesting. Uh, four or less players is better. Um, so those are some of the negatives. So overall, what do I think? Well, I typically love my deduction games, and I love them pure. Anytime a game tends to do other things, like in addition to deduction, I don't typically like it as much. I'd say that's similar here, 
But I will say that I love deductions games so much, but I have a, I always have a hard time finding people that love them as much and play them with me. And so this game allows me to get a, a, you know, a set of players that like co-op games to the table, and now I get my deduction that I like, and I get the co-op that I like too. I would prefer if I'm gonna play deduction just a pure deduction game, but this allows me to get more deduction playing done because I'm more easily able to get other players to the table to play this. So I prefer straight deduction. I would just prefer just to play the mastermind portion of this, but I understand I like the co-op aspect too, but it allows me to play deduction more. Uh, so it is a very interesting game. I liked it, it's solid. I can definitely recommend it, and that's Rising 5. This video was sponsored by Miniature Markets Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com. Thank you.